Hey, what's up? I'm Mike Squires and my co-host, Mr. Big. This is Couchless Podcast, episode number 183, with my guest, the uh, amazingly vibey drummer, Parker Kindred. Parker's had a bunch of great gigs, um, and not, you know, not by accident. Uh, he played with, at the very end of Jeff Buckley's life, he played on that, uh, the Sketches album. Uh, he's played with Anthony and the Johnsons, which I saw live uh, in 2009 in Seattle, I think at the Moore Theater. And it was, I mean, it remains one of the most beautiful live shows I've ever seen when I think about all of the shows I've seen. It was, it was incredible. And, um, yeah, I didn't know it at the time until, you know, much later. Of course, I mean, I didn't know him. Um, and, uh, Jonas Policewoman, Cass McCombs, you know, the list goes on. He's a fantastic drummer, sweet man, and I had a hell of a good time talking with him. So I hope you enjoy this conversation as much as I did. If you're enjoying the Couchress podcast or the uh, cover song videos that uh, we're putting out, please, by all means, support us at patreon.com slash couchriffs. Parker is appearing in an upcoming episode, and it's fucking awesome, of course. Um, let's see, what else? Thank you, Variety Coffee Roasters in Brooklyn, New York. Also, they have uh, some cafes in the city. But uh, here's the deal. You want yourself a Couch Riffs coffee mug? Easy. You can get one over at Variety. They're selling them on the website. Or uh, add, it to the, uh, add it to your shopping cart. Pick up two bags of coffee. They come in boxes, so they call them boxes of coffee. And uh, the code you want to enter is Couch Riffs, one word. You get your mug for free. That's pretty sweet. That's sweet. That's like... Uh, I don't know, probably 20% discount. That's awesome. Or it's free and full price for the coffee. I don't care how you think about it. Um, but that's where you can get a Couchress mug. Um, they're killer, just like Couchress. So thank you to Variety Coffee Roasters. I drink their coffee every day here at home. Um, I wouldn't steer you towards anything I wouldn't do myself. But I would do a lot of shit too. <laughs> Uh, thank you also to River City Guitars in Spokane, Washington. Every day is a buying day. If you've got a cool vintage used boutique piece of gear um, of any kind, guitar, bass, amp, effects, mixing console, drums, keyboards, give them a shout. Sales.RiverCityGuitars uh, at gmail.com. Send them a picture. Tell them Couchriff sent you. Tell them I sent you. They'll treat you right. Again, these are friends of mine. I wouldn't steer you in a direction that uh, I don't have 100% confidence in. So thank you to River City Guitars. It's also one of the only places in the country where you can get one of these amazing... Oh, look at that. You can see me over here. You can see me. Oh. Um, uh, it's one of the only places you can get the CN90 by Marvin Guitars, co-designed by yours truly. To celebrate the hundred the uh, hundredth episode of the Couchers podcast, that's that's pretty killer. I love this guitar. I play it a ton. That's why it's you know right there. It's one of the most convenient guitars that I can get to, always. So, um, go check it out. Thank you, River City Guitars. You guys are great. Every uh, you know what? Thanks for listening. Thanks for commenting, sharing, reviewing. What you know, all the stuff. Thank you for all that. It means a lot. Um, I have a bunch of big, inflated, and excited ideas about uh, where I want to take couch riffs, and your your listening and watching and sharing and all the support that you give me really means a lot. So thank you. I, from the bottom of my heart, thank you. Don't forget the golden rule: treat people the way you want to be treated. The world would just be a wonderful fucking place if everyone did that, you know? Uh, just don't be a dick. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you great. How you doing, man? Cool, man. Let me turn this off. How you doing, man? 
Oh, you know, I'm still, after six years, not really fully adjusted to Northeast summers. The Where are you from? The Northwest. Where yeah. about? From Seattle. Oh. Yeah. So it's like, you know, 75. You got the sweet springs there, man, in May. No, uh, yeah, no, it's like uh, eight months of, you know, shit, and then yeah, yeah, of man. May, and then the most beautiful summers that you've ever seen. Yeah. Oh yeah, cool. But yeah, it's, yeah, it's pretty sweaty outside here. It's fucking early, dude. Right. Yeah, I, I just I just spent the day with my daughter at a swimming hole. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. Well, um, yeah. you're you're. In I'm Poughkeepsie upstate. Now? I'm upstate. I'm up in Poughkeepsie at the moment. Um, I was in New Paltz, and then um, I'm up in September. I'm going to move to Kingston. Oh, okay. Oh, that's that's pretty close to me now. Uh, Poughkeepsie, home of the Chance Theater. Home of the Chance. Uh, that's right, and it's uh, also the capital of New York at one point. Is that right? Yeah. But then they were like, fuck it, no one can say it, so we got to find another place. It's also kind of cool because Poughkeepsie is as far north as the um, tide goes in. Oh, is that right? Yeah, and then that's where the water comes all the way up here. And it's also the deepest point in the Hudson. Really? Yeah, it's 200 feet there. Are you serious? Yeah. That's, uh, That's very deep. Yeah, yeah. I wonder what sort of geological event caused it to be that deep. Yeah, it's a good question. I don't know. It's pretty gnarly here, though. It's like, you know, I, I watched the French Connection as soon as I moved here, just because there's that first scene where Hackman's running in the Santa Claus outfit with Roy Schneider and they're like, or Scheider or whatever, and then they get, they catch the dude. And, you know, he keeps saying, like, you know, where'd you get the shit? Where'd you get the kid? And he's like, were you picking your feet? Were you picking? And he's like, the, the guy who's like, they're talking to is all like, what? And then he was like, were you ever in Poughkeepsie? You know, and he keeps talking about Poughkeepsie. And he's like, were you picking your feet in Poughkeepsie? You know, and he's like, well, I'm arresting you for having the shit. And I'm arresting you for picking your feet in Poughkeepsie. But it's, it's like. It's a weird city because, like, I've talked to a bunch of people who grew up here and they're like shocked that anybody's moving here. Right. Like, you kind of leave Poughkeepsie. Yeah. Nobody really moves to Poughkeepsie. That yeah. downtown area is pretty down. That's where I am. It's pretty down. It's fucked up. Yeah. It's really, I mean, you know, I walk out and like they're. <laughs> My, on my block, I'm, I'm, you know, I mean, it's funny because I talked to somebody recently who grew up here who was th- throwing coffee in another town. But he's like, I was like, yeah, man, it seemed, I'm like, he's like, where are you? I'm like, well, I'm on Garden Street. It's kind of like on the edge of the hood. He's like, dude, everywhere in Poughkeepsie is on the edge of the hood. Right. You know? I'm like, right. It is. But like I walked out my door and there was two guys. We have the only dumpster on the block. In, in the back where we park cars and stuff. And, like, everybody in the block just throws their shit in this dumpster. Right. So, like, you know, you wake up and there's, like, you know, battles between homeless dudes, like, junkie homeless dudes fighting for their bottles. Right. It's, it's rough. Like, it's not, it's not where I want to be at the moment. But it is where I am. And sure. it's just, like, and it's... um. Yeah, it's brought up a lot of stuff, man. You know, I mean, mostly it's just like the systemic racist shit that goes on and also just the systemic poverty that goes on in this country, man. It's crazy, you know, because there this, I mean, Poughkeepsie, if it wasn't for some of the places that, you know, some people have had the thoughts like, oh, I'll open like a hip place here, or, you know, good food here or something. It's like a food desert, man, here, you know? So it's just kind of like, you know, people don't have anything to eat. And whatever they do, they... 
Well, that's a fucked up part of poverty is like where there is no money, there's no healthy food. And then when there, where there's no healthy food, there are a number of common, you know, deadly ailments that thrive through that community. And people don't, and because of the food and because the facilities aren't there and because things aren't accessible, people... It's really designed for people not know how to take care of themselves and not learn and not, and not learn. Yeah. You know, and it's fucking, I'm just watching it and it's like, it's, it's oppressive to the soul. Not even as like a, in, in a color situation, just like nobody deserves to live like that. man. It's just, it's just, it's just, you know, it's just it, that shit's it's deep it's deep you know and it's like i'm the only white cat here and that's fine it's you know i've been in that situation before and it's like I, it's not comfortable and like i tend to like get in this place of you know like you know fear but like ultimately it's like i have to remember there's another side to that and that's what do these motherfuckers think I'm doing here? Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? Sure. Like, I might be a narc. I might be a child, like, predator. Right. You know, they have no idea what the fuck I'm doing here. Why the fuck did this guy move here? Right. You know? So there's, like, you know, I forget that aspect. Of it too, you know? It's like, you know. Drummer so, is the last thing on their mind. What's that? <laughs> Drummer is the last thing on yeah, their yeah, mind. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They're like. Yeah. White guy yeah. just moved in. I bet he's a must be a drummer. Must be, yeah. Or a yeah. or a trumpeter. <laughs> yeah, trumpeter, drummer, or a pedophile. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Sex offender just moved in across the street. Yeah. Uh, where did you grow up? Uh, I grew up in Angle, New Jersey. Oh, okay. So you didn't. I mean, you didn't go far to get to the city, and you you've been in the city or in Brooklyn forever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My dad, my dad was a jazz musician. Uh, he played tenor, and he, you know, I grew up in Philly, and then when I was really young, we moved up to Englewood because it was close to the city, so he could get in and out of city to gig. So, did you grow up going and seeing your, watching your dad play, or was that yeah. sort of a separate? Yeah. You did. No, you saw him I mean, play a no, lot. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, he had, like, jam sessions in the living room all the oh, time. that's killer. You know, it's like, I mean, that, you know, drummers were set up, and, you know. It was, like, full-on jazz jams, you know. There was a guy that he had a quint. My dad had put a quintet together because they'd play out, but they also did something in the education system. Where they, at, in the 70s, these jazz groups would go around to, like, elementary schools, and yeah. they would, like, go in the auditoriums and they do these like jazz, this is jazz and this is what the drums can do. And this is what the sax can do. This is what the bass can do. And when we all get together and we do this. And uh, one of the guys in the band was this older uh, black cat. And his name was Joe Carroll. And Joe was a singer and Joe was um, really famous on that scene. Probably many people don't know who he is, but he was uh in the Dizzy Gillespie Orchestra, oh, wow. and he and he um, he was the singer. He was kind of like the guy who kind of showed, was like kind of gave the torch to Dizzy with scatting. He was like a, he was like the scat king, you know. And uh, so, like, if there's a song in those play, you know, um, like in the land of Obladi is a really famous one. Like, it's just this really surrealist song that's like. Joe is the pen, the lyrics. And so like they, you know, he had this quintet and yeah, my dad was always really into playing with singers, you know? I mean, he did his fair share of trios and, you know, quartets and, you know, um, he put together, you know, he wrote and stuff too, but, you know, the older I get, the more I understand how much he, he really liked playing with vocalists, right. you know? He was he was a very lyrical player. Like he wasn't a fast guy, you know. He was a he was a more of a Ben Webster, Lester Young 
kind of like, you know, Coleman Hawkins, like in that old school, Johnny Hodges, those guys. Dude's band. So he's not he's not with us anymore? No, he, he passed away in 2016, yeah. Fairly recently. Was he yeah. playing all the way up through his entire life? Um, yeah, he was. That's what he did. I mean, he 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 had a, a hard bout with the alcohol. Like that's kind of what took him out, you know. Um, and so his his wife, his step my stepmom, he ran, he remarried a woman named Ann Phillips, who is also a jazz vocalist. Um, she was. Yeah, she goes all the way back to like the late fifties in New York City wow. doing j- jingles and did the wrote the Pepsi jingle in the sixties. She was doing BBs on Carol King Tapestry and right. you know, she did like, you know, was like on the Jackie Gleason show, like wow. like just like yeah. it has such a like rich musical history, you know. Um but she got fed up and uh she she divorced him at the end because it was getting really gnarly with him. It was like just Russian roulette, like you never knew what you're gonna get. And my half sister's marriage from before my mom, my dad had two other daughters, and they he moved down to Nashville. So it's not a whole lot of jazz in Nashville. No. No, you don't put the the sax back in the country and western either. <laughs> Is there Doesn't a country happen. song? Where, I mean, surely there was a country song in the '80s with a sax solo. There was a sax solo on everything, right? Probably. I'm sure we could scour the internet. I'm gonna yeah. Google it as sax soon as we're solos done. and country music. Yeah. It's gotta be. <laughs> um. So he he, yeah. he didn't go. So anyway, he he you know he got together like a little like, you know, it was really hard for me finding guys down there because everybody in Nashville is playing fucking country and western doing studio gigs, you know. So he 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 was playing a little bit, but it was pretty uh it was pretty um grim. You know yeah. it was a it was like a sad ending to like you know I mean you move away from New York to play jazz you're kind of like moving away from the I mean you can do it in LA you can, you can do it out there. You know, there's, there's guys in California, you know, sure. you know, but you know, maybe in, maybe in Chicago or St. Louis or Kansas city or something. But, um, yeah, it's also like a dying genre for like those old guys. Right. You know, like, it's like, uh, it's hard to find. Like, I mean, I've been more seeing more and more like younger younger guys on Instagram that I sort of like follow from follower, you know, that I sort of like end up finding. And they're really like, they're really like kind of like swinging again, you know, like they're really like playing like kind of more traditional shit. They're not like the athletes. I mean, they are in the sense that they're young and they're vibrant and they're excited and they have chops. Like I can't ever understand jazz drumming chops. This just (laughs) blows my fucking mind, you know? It's just such a discipline, you know, like really is. It's like so much practice. So that's something that never seeped into your playing is, is just that the like jazz chops and, and that was never something that interested you. I mean, it's a really, it's a really sensitive issue. Not that I don't want to talk about it, but I mean, it's just like, I have so much shame about like not, taking the suggestions and the and what was offered to me right you know you know what i mean like i i was a kid and i think you know i was like around it and my dad was like a jazz guy it's all about jazz you know i remember the first time we heard run dmc fucking it was like you know whatever it was it was the first jam that came out on um that first record what was it um uh not my adidas it was pre my adidas no 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 it was like you know it's like like before um, king of rock very first record can't remember what song it was but i remember sitting in the burger king parking lot in like 1984 with him 
and it came on and said, this shit's never going to last. And I was just like, <laughs> yeah, you know, and like, you know, and I was just, you know, and I was just like, well, I think this is cool. I learned all the lyrics to it, you know, it was just right. kind of like, and, um, I was 12, you know, I was like, that was what I wanted to do, you know, and like, is that what you wanted to do first? You wanted to be an MC first? No, well, I mean, it was just the rhythm of it was so cool. Yeah, no, it was incredible. You know, it was so cool. Then you could deliver it, you know? It wasn't, and like, and like Daryl had the coolest fucking voice of all time. Oh, yeah. You know, you just wanted to be that guy. Until Chuck D came along. Right, right, exactly. Right, exactly. A whole other thing, right? But I mean, just, just the, the timbre of Daryl's voice was just so fucking like, damn, man, that guy's fucking, yeah, it's just cool, you know? And, um, you know, it's like, my dad bought me a drum kit because I love, I love the drums. Um, I, I was just, I was playing tambourine with a group, you know, in the living room when I was really young. And uh, there's tapes of me playing and it's like, times there and shit you know it's right. just like you know my dad just kind of heard it you know he's like he always knew i was into it. i'd always be like hovering around the drums so he found a drum set in the back of a paint truck like some you know painter had this fucking shitty drum set covered in paint my dad was like how much do you want for that and guys gave him like you know sold it for like 80 bucks it was um it's called tempo a tempo drum set is uh like an offshoot japanese offshoot from um shit i don't um uh what's the brand is it Kittle an offshoot of fives it's a pearl it's a oh. pearl offshoot like you know it's like the same wood but the hardware is just the poor right fucking dumpy, you know so and japan was making these things so i still have that kit you know? Whoa. Still, still have that kit. yeah yeah i got that one when I was 10. so i was a small kid and i just it just sat in the basement you know we had a shitty haunted basement you know with all sorts of shit in it right. for a long time and then and then when i was 13 i saw it again and i took it out and I, you know started messing around with it 12 or 13 yeah yeah 12 12 like 12 i set it up and then i like, learned honky tonk women that was the first song i learned you know i could do that you know right you know that that kind of thing you got a cowbell you know, did that song so jump could, out at you because it starts with the drums? Probably. Right. And it was it was funky, it was slow enough. I could like I could sort of divide it. It wasn't as syncopated you know? as Walk This Way and it was like It was just it was just yeah, it was just also just the cowbell. It was just like so funky. It's just like yeah. such a janky fucking groove that like you know, you don't have to like be like, oh, you know, like it's not like you know. My first love was was doo man. doo music was like the music I like first loved. Um, and we also had a South African family that we rented out our attic to uh, one summer. We went up to the uh, Adirondacks one summer and there was this African family that we, we had this night, the house we bought had like a furnished attic with a bathroom in it. So we never used it. So we just kind of let them stay up there and when we got back, like, I don't know, that probably happened like when I was before I was in my double j digit years and we had these closets upstairs and I found in the closet, I found all these Af like South African 45s that I still have. And I had this mid Mickey Mouse record player. You yeah. Know, with, like, and like, you know, and I put the 45s on the Mickey Mouse record player. It was like really fast. And like, you know, I just scribbled off the big African name and I wrote rock music on it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I still have those. I wish I had them here, I'd say. But uh, uh that's, um, that's hilarious. Yeah, and then it was like that, and then like my you know, my parents bought me some oldie but goodie tapes, you know, and that that shit really turned me on, man. That was like that was like my first love, like the African music, the doo-wop, stones, and then like, you know, jazz is just always around, and then rap, you know? So it was like those, that was like the, that was sort of like the incarnation of things. 
um, that turned me on. And then, of course, like and so, wait a minute. So you're like 13 (laughs) years old, and you're into you're into doo wop and the role. Like, what year is this? 1980. Yeah, that's probably 1983. Right. So 1983. It's not particularly hip to be into doo wop and African music if you're a teenager. Like, 13 year olds are into Flock of Seagulls, or they're into. Right, maybe Tears for Fears and In Excess, and the only band from the the only current band I liked at that time was Men at Work. Oh, that's a killer band. I mean, fucking Colin Hayes' voice, dude. Fucking. Oh, incredible! It's just, just, just fucking. I love Colin Hayes. Still love his voice. His voice yeah. is so cool, you know. And like, I think that's what I really gravitated towards with with music was the was the vocalists, you know. Like, I mean, at the group, sure, but like for rock music, it was always, a, there was something had to be, you know, I mean, I love the police. They were fucking amazing. That, sure. you know, that was another band, Regatta de Blois. Sabbath was the first cassette I ever bought with my own money, Paranoid. You know, I think when I finally scraped together my first, um, you know, paper route money that I had, you know, when I was like later on that year. Yeah, it was like Sabbath, sixth grade. Bill Ward yeah. swings hard. He's like, he's Dude, obviously a jazz guy. I mean, you know, that's the thing. It's like, I I feel like what I learned from growing up around that is that I I, ha- I do have an, I like to just kind of like play with a swing. And it's not, it's not a, you know, like a fucking deep swing, but it's always in there a little bit. And, uh, and I don't like, and I like to, sort of like improvise yeah not like not like watch me go but like i can't play the same thing twice the same just can't do it It doesn't feel right to play this i mean things just happen and i go you know that's what happens right there's no there's no i mean i i used to play in bands like you know i played in the first band i ever played in uh with a really good guitar player who was like just a metal shredder, watched Headbangers Ball and fucking did scales. You know, that's like what he did. You yeah. know, we'd on Friday night, we'd just sit there and he'd be like, you know, and we'd just be like, you know, what do you think? You know, he's like, it's just ridiculous, you know? So we put together a band and um, <laughs> that was the first time I understood I really got into like playing it again and again and again and again. And like it was, it was great. I mean, my favorite part about, and I'm still friends with those guys too. It's like, you know, it's like we still play music together. I mean, in fact, we like put a, a virtual band together during the pandemic just to like entertain ourselves, you know? Right. And we haven't been, we haven't even played in a band together for fucking years, you know? How long so, did that band last when you were kids? And how old uh, were you when you, when you guys put your first we, band we, together? We, yeah, we, 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 uh, we put our first band together when I think, yeah, it was like 16. It was called Mushmouth of all things, you know, <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, you know, it was like, it was like, you know, uh, freaky styly up on, you know, mofo party plan mixed with, uh, you know, uh, Slayer and, um, not that I was a Slayer guy guitar player was and uh you know just like metallica you know it was like sort of hard player was like metallica and like you know knew all that shit could rip all that shit you know violence the band violence you know just like then it was hardcore we knew that one of the one of the guys who would later become one of the drummers and sick of it all you know and just like then later, like there was a hardcore scene. We were going to those hardcore matinees down at CDs, you know, all ages fucking shows. We'd be like standing around the fucking block waiting to see Sunday matinees at one one o'clock. You know, it's just like ridiculous skinheads, and we're like these, you know, beautiful like porcelain skin, long hair, you know, like fucking suburban kids. You know, we had no business being there. It's a <laughs> it's a miracle we didn't get punched in the fucking face. You know, really. I mean, we saw some amazing shit, but like uh, that band lasted. That was just like a high school band, man. We played, you know, we played every weekend. They, one of my friends lived 
I went to school with uh, in Jersey and Englewood moved from Englewood to Chappaqua, New York, when they were six and we're still like friends. We met when we were three and, uh, you know, he's still playing bass with people out in LA now. And, and, um, uh, and then the other guys out in LA now. And, uh, uh, yeah, we played battle of the bands. We opened for all. Oh, and, rad. At um at the Anthrax over in Connecticut, fucking um, it's a all it was an all ages venue, and uh, you know, uh, yeah, Norwalk, Norwalk, Connecticut. There's a club called the Anthrax. Have you heard of that? No. Oh yeah, there's there's a book about it. It was like it was owned by these two guys, and they they didn't serve booze. They served, you know, it was like because an all ages club, but later on they were busted for having selling he had a huge coke thing like it was like all a front but they right. had the cool like we you know we we saw Fugazi there on the first tour you know we like ended up like playing opening for all fucking bill stevenson hairy ass fucking eight body right playing you know so that was amazing and that we did that in, you know in 1989 with them and then like so that was like 88, 89, 90, 91. We, yeah, we, we, we had a band through high school and, you know, we, and anyway, long story short, I, I, my mom would drive me sometimes halfway and then their mom would come down and drive, drop, get me halfway. And then we, on the side of the street in Nyack, we'd fucking from Jersey to, we'd take all the drums out of the car and fucking put them in there and then they drive us <laughs> all the way up there and that's that stay the weekend up there and we jam all weekend you know? wow it was great i mean my mom god bless her fucking soul you know my parents weren't together so so my mom you know there's nothing better than having a mom that lets you play drums man uh did you have? Did you record that band? I imagine you had a boombox. Did you save any of those oh, cassettes? Yeah, we, oh you have my all... god, dude! I have all that shit. When I you listen back that. now, how does it make? It, you I feel? just want to. I want to jump off a roof. <laughs> <laughs> it's so bad. It's so. It's just painful. But you know what I was gonna say was when I was talking about the like being able to do it again and again and again. I, I said this to these guys because we were on a like a kind of like a big uh, all party call you know, like like a month ago or maybe two months ago. And I just got to say like, yo, you guys, thank you so much for like like you know letting letting us letting me, but all of us just like we just allowed each other to fuck up. Right. Nobody was like being a dick about it, you know. Like everybody was just allowed to like get better together, and um, and like what a gift, man! You know, well, that's something that doesn't happen as easily when you start when you meet grown ups. No, when, when you when we have established ideas about how no. how things are and expectations. When you're a kid, there's just a different kind of excitement about possibility yeah hopefully that doesn't go away i mean you know the people that oh i mean what's funny is like i mean how i'm sure you can relate but how long did he jam on a riff for <laughs> <laughs> can you imagine you know, doing that now <laughs> i mean i mean you'd hope it would go somewhere right. you know but like you know but if it's that damn good, it must be worth doing, you know, but it was just, it was just, everything was so new. Yeah. And, 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 you know, it was just like, and there was so much just energy. Man. And like, I don't think that, I don't think that, um, that excitement necessarily has to go away. I mean, I still can do that with certain people that I still play with. Um, but I can see the brain working more. Right. You know what I mean? Like I, 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 the brain sort of gets in the way. 
Right. You know, and, uh, and, um, you know, it's like sometimes you're afraid to like, I know for me as a drummer, I can't, I can't, I, or just as a musician, I should say, if I'm not feeling it, I stop. Right. Bad situation for a drummer. Like, I mean, that, that feels sad for people that like, you know, it's, it's brutal because I mean, it's also the thing that has, I mean, I think I know myself well enough not to say yes to certain things right. because I really can't bring it for the people that want me to do the things that they want me to do. Cause I'm just not that guy. Right. I, I can't just throw on any hat and be like, sure. I mean, I'm happy to give it a try, but I could you, probably, I'd, ra- I'd rather say, I know the guy for you. Did you ever have a double kick? No. No, say. because, no, because the, the, the records I played with were like Ze- Zeppelin one right. and all those fucking records. So I was trying to fucking do all that fucking Bonham bass drum shit like that, you know, all right. the triplet shit, you know, that was, no, I mean, I still, get behind a double bass i'm like what the fuck is this thing it's just in the way what is this pedal like it's fucking <laughs> i'm a terrible you know, drummer every- like all guitar players really i'm a frustrated envious failed drummer i don't have it you know what that's not true i mean i'm just gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna just lay this out there because what what i find a lot of the time and um one of the best guitar players i've ever played with with had the honor of playing with just by chance uh one night he came up and played with this band i was playing with was richard lloyd and richard mm-hmm. lloyd came up and dude i i mean not only, i mean maybe it has something to do with volume too because he fucking ripped it <laughs> loud but like but like but like that motherfucker, I was like, holy shit, if this is like anything, what it was like to play with Hendrix, like when you play with somebody with that good rhythm, that dominant rhythm, as a drummer, like, because that's what everybody's doing, or everybody's drumming, it's right. kind of where I'm going with it. Like, you just get taken. You know, and everybody's just playing like it's like nobody's like struggling to like set the groove. Everybody's just somebody has to lead. I heard this interview with Jim Keltner a little while ago, and you can watch it on YouTube. He's talking about playing with Dylan and all these everybody he's played with. And I really like his approach because not only as as his playing, but his philosophy, which and I think it's probably why I like his playing so much is that. He thinks of drumming as a support to the guitar. You know, it's like, you know, his, it, you know, you have to have a strong rhythm. You're playing, this fucking song is the fucking song, man. Like, right. you know, you're like the drum should just Well, that's be like pretty old school. That's, that's a pretty old school approach. But if you hear all that Wilbury shit, if you hear all that Beatles shit, right. Ringo's not like keeping all the time. All those other motherfuckers are keeping the time. Ringo's like playing in between shit and like you know he's like not everybody's playing like when you my favorite shit is like that tom petty shit where you're like is that Uh, hi hat no oh that's acoustic guitar yeah you know it is interesting i i do love how like you know i never paid attention to it when i was a kid but because i didn't give a shit about an acoustic guitar but acoustic guitar is is a percussion instrument on on a recording it's it's incredible it's you know it's amazing. yeah it's a shaker it's a melodic shaker you know yeah it's incredible man it's a cymbal it's a hi-hat you know the body is a bass drum you know top of it's a snare you know or a tom or it's just like you know you got you got the whole kid is on the guitar so the, the instrument that fascinates me the most is bass because I just think it's the fucking coolest, most sublime instrument, you know? Like, I mean, you got a good... I don't even know what a good bass player is, to be honest. The thing is, is when your band has... First of all, if you're... 
I've said this a million times. If if your drummer sucks, then your band sucks. I don't care how yes, good your songs that's are. That's true. That's true. You can still have great songs, but if your band has a bad drummer, then your band is bad. And everyone else can suck or everyone else can deliver sure. a mediocre performance and it can right. still be killer if the drummer is killer. That's true. There's truth in that too. Absolutely. hundred percent. Because yeah, I mean, that's sort of the Charlie that's when I think of that, I think of, um, it's interesting because like the stones are a great example of a band that you're like, who's leading this fucking thing. Right. You know, it's every, it's like always like somebody's pulling ahead. Nobody's everything's imperfect, but it's all just fucking moving. Everybody's cat. Everybody's helping each other all the time in that band. And Bill Wyman is the only guy who's fucking keeping him down. In that band. You know what I mean? But on the recordings, He's, he doesn't even play all the bass. I mean, all I have all I, I, whoever played Satisfaction Bass, greatest that, and I wonder if Bowie ripped that on uh, Rebel Rebel because it's kind of got a similar right, like like rubber band thing happening. Yeah, and just harmonically, what's going on? It's just it's so deep. You know? When a band has a standout bass player, and I don't mean like End Twistle where it's like ripping, right? But you know when when there's an outstanding bass player that plays to the song, just like if, you know, it can be as important as the vocalist or the drummer to me, which are the two most important things. Absolutely. Uh, the melody, the melody going with the vocal on the bass and counter melodies. It's like, yeah, it's, it's maybe my favorite. Yeah. I mean, so, you know, it's funny because, like, I don't think of myself. I mean, I love drumming, but I, I think of myself as a part of, you know, like I'm hearing everything all the time when it's going on. I hear it every, you know, I hear all the parts. So, you know, I don't think of myself. I mean, I know, I think what you're saying too is like, do you know who Steven Bernstein is, horn player? No. He plays with, he's, he's like a, New York cat. He just he plays with a lot of people downtown, like John Zorn, Stone, Stone kind of situation downtown, and and uh, and is just a bad motherfucker. And uh, he's a trumpet player. And I was talking to him when I was moving upstate because he was he lives in Nyack. And I was like, man, I don't know what I'm gonna do, man. He's like, I was like, what's the upstate scene like, you know? And he's like, you know, he knows a lot. There's like lots of jam bands up here and shit. Uh, and there's a lot of awesome shit going on. It's just, just kind of got to know what's going on. He just said, just do you, man. Don't worry about it. Like, because right. whatever you do, nobody, you know, it's just like you have your thing, you know? And like, I think like once, once you can just hook into your thing, it's just about believing in the thing. And then that confidence that comes in that sort of like nur nurturing of your thing gives it what you're talking about. That, that just sort of like that drummer back there is just doing their fucking thing. And everybody's just kind of like able to like, you know, that's taken care of, you know, I know I can do that. Um, but I like when everybody's doing it together. I don't like being the fucking guy. You know, cause, it seems like yeah. you would you would love to be in a jam band since the playing like precision repeating parts over and over is not your ideal. But I need a break because that shit gets tired. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like I, I, uh, I you know, I'm just like I just want a minute to breathe. Man. And it's like, you know, it's just like not only that, but it's like. I don't trust anybody that much. You know? <laughs> Somebody's uh, gonna throw some cheesy shit after a while. I know it. Yeah, you know, for sure. It's just like you know, you know what I mean. Um, unless you're playing like you know the Woody Woodpecker theme over a solo, I'm not, I'm not down with it. But um, uh, yeah, it's just it's a uh, yeah. I like space in music, man. You know. Yeah. So therefore, with that, you know, I'm looking. I'd like to play with people that, you know 
know, like have good time, you know, and like know how to like, like hear, hear this the puzzle piece, you know. So like everybody's got their moment, and like when we, it's like the James Brown thing when you put it together. Everybody's got their little machine thing happening, you know. Nobody's doing anything fancy, but when you put it all together, it's just like fuck. That is so fucking badass, yeah. you know. And that's that's like, you know. Yeah, I mean, even if you listen to those Zeppelin records, Jimmy Page is doing all of it, and John Paul Jones, you know, they're like bombs just fucking laying it fucking down. Right. But those all guys the crazy are like rhythm. This. Yeah, all the polyrhythms coming from the the yeah. melodies. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. First, oh my God, dude. I I, I threw on um, rock and roll the other day. And I don't know why, why. I just threw it on and I was like, it just came on. And it was during one of the, you know, the very first, uh, you know, and I heard the way Plant tapered off on the note and it was like one of those holy shit moments like i i never honed in on that moment right those fuck i love that shit man i love when music is music's the greatest man well it's it's hard especially with a song like that where we've all heard it a hundred thousand times on the radio right yeah where I've been focusing a lot on not having a knee jerk reaction to songs that I grew up being pummeled with because many, most of them were on the radio for, for good reason. Right. Right. Someone paid to have them there, but the other reason, (laughs) the other reason is that they're great. Yeah. Um, Yeah. And, uh, and there, if you really listen, especially on headphones, because now, more than ever, we're all taking music in on headphones, right? And so we're yep. hearing things that we didn't hear before we're in a, you know, some truck with the windows down and the radio up. Like, there, you know, like a lot of nuance is lost. Yeah, yes, yes. So yeah, yeah, and also just like that riff in particular is just like, <laughs> you're not paying attention to plan. Right. Unless he's like, Man, I want to. but not the end of that phrase. You're waiting for the next line, but the way he trails off on the note, it's like fucking haunting. I was just like, wow, man. Like that's the, that kind of like those like little moments of, of like, like Indian food or whatever. You're, <laughs> like you taste that extra spice for the you're first right. time. Right? <laughs> just like, you're like, what the fuck is that shit? You know? Like, <laughs> wow, man. Like, uh, it's just like, I just, I love music for that reason. You know, and it's like, you just know, it's like, it just, I think sometimes like going in, thinking I know the song, like it hit me, I was off guard. So I didn't have my, I didn't have my, oh, I know what this song is already. Right. I came in, I came in on a weird spot, you know? Like when the when you think you know where the beat is and then fucking turns around and then you're like into the song, you know. Well, but, that song uh, in particular does that a lot. If you come in, yeah, you turn the radio yeah. on and it's on, you're like, "What? It, what are they doing?" Yeah. That's my favorite shit. Man. When you like Charlie Watts does it all the time too. Where he, like you think you, you know where it is and then it's like, Spap! you know, you're like, "What the fuck, you?" He's, he is you know? under celebrated. I agree. I mean, people just think he's a sloppy drummer. It's like, dude, that guy is like such a fucking bat. That snare drum is never missing. Uh, is it true? Do you know if this is true? I, uh, someone told me this. A friend of mine told me this. Charlie Watts bought a drum kit like early on, and he still plays the same drum kit. I think that's true. The same drum that's kit. True. Still plays the same drum kit. Yeah, I, I, I know he's got it. Because I watched, uh, I watched, uh, sadly, I watched <laughs> um, Chad Smith's got this like interviewing drummers thing. Yeah. Not that I have a beef with Chad, but like, just, I wish he just didn't get dressed up in a suit with a hat backwards to do it. That's all. He um, did that? I just wish. What? 
he put a suit on and and wore a backwards baseball cap. Yeah, yeah. It's like just he, and he's talking to Charlie Watts, who's just Mister Class. Right. So just take, just take the hat off, you know. Like, right. Like or get a classy well, hat if you if you want to cover your bald spot, get a classy get, hat. Exactly. Thank you. But um, but in that interview, Charlie said, "Yeah, I still I have this. I still have that kit, and he's buying like these." kits that are just like you know they were somebody else's like i forget who like he bought a gene krupp krupa like drum right. kit you know one of his idols or something wow so insane amount of money you know yeah i mean like yeah if you so, could buy if if there was a fantasy drum kit like someone's drum kit that you could buy you know money wasn't I mean, an object and there I, was one no, i mean i I've actually, I, I, the, the sizes that I think about the most were actually Charlie's sizes. Cause I think he, but plays, I mean, uh, ac- I'm talking about actual drums. Like if you could buy someone's tour kit and every I mean, drum kit in the history of rock tours was available. I'm trying to think about my size. So I would definitely wouldn't buy Stuart Copeland's drum kit because he's a lanky fuck, you know. But like he makes those drums sound great. It, it, I mean, I love Charlie Watts setup because he's always got the, the three piece kit, and he's got this fucking. He always has a broken china as his crash. And that is his fucking. That is his shit, man. That like he, it's just. His drums always sound good. If I had to think about like not touring kits, I would think maybe I would go with like Al Jackson's stuff, you know, from like, you know, Booker T or like, or the High Records Vault, you know, yeah. or the Stacks, like, you know, because he was like both of those, you know, so, but like High Records has that, you know, which is like, doesn't get better than that you can hear the fucking snares on the bottom going right greatest but then on the booker t shit you got that like rogers kit which is like that snare gun which is like Thwack! you know and you're just like oh god it's so popping man and then you have the james brown kits with just you know they also have that tight fucking snare and that's such a it's like i'm so scared of that snare because you have to be so on right there's no it's not unforgiving totally unforgiving you know but i like i like i like the you know the boosh i like the boosh you know the boosh is nice you know did you ever did you ever have a piccolo snare in the 90s dude i have a funny that story about that (laughs) i mean it's not that funny it's actually it's just i never i never wanted one and then I, I, there was a place in, in Williamsburg that, that was called, uh, oh shit, MTC or something like that. It was this uh, Austrian guy had a drum store on uh, Lorimer Street by Graham. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and uh, his, his name was Marcus. He was really, really sweet guy. And he built his own drums there. And I had a recording session and... We just wanted a really poppy snare for the session. I didn't have that. I had like, you know, just standard snares. And so I was thinking, let me just try this. So I got like, it was fucking awesome. Because you don't have to hit them hard. And they give you that thing, you know? Right. I mean, you know, they give a, a lot, lot back. of people get the whack the shit out of them. But like, you could just like, you know, you know, we all know in recording, you don't hit the snare drum hard. It's just like, you, know, you just don't do that. So, uh, but this thing gave me that. So I went and fucking found this Pearl Piccolo. I think it was actually the one I used from him. I think I bought that one. And I was so jazzed about it, man. I threw it in the fucking cab. And I got in the cab and I got to the rehearsal space. And I left it in the cab and I never saw it again. No. Yeah. <laughs> and that's the only Piccolo snare you ever owned. for. You had it for, for, for like an hour and a half. No, well, I mean, I used it on one recording, but oh, then God, when I yeah, actually right. bought it, like, I was like, I never even made it in the rehearsal space. Ah, uh, 
<laughs> and you and yet you, you you were just like that's a sign. I was like, <laughs> yeah, this is a sign. I, I should. <laughs> the universe is trying to tell me something. So, so, so two thousand one. T- t- tell me what the name of your band was again. Mushmouth. No, in two thousand one, that was from nineteen. No, that was nineteen eighty nine, ninety ninety one. Started right. in eighty seven. In, in two thousand one, I moved to Brooklyn in nineteen ninety six, um, and then I was playing in a band called the Negatones. I'd started a band with my friend called the Mooney Suzuki, and then I. You were uh, in Mooney Suzuki. Yeah, we started that band together, and then like. But and simultaneously, I met Jeff Buckley, and so we're playing a gig with the Negatones at the Green Door Space in 26th Street, and then and I knew the bass player from Jeff's band that I'd played with, fucking, like, three years earlier in some fucking wood shop on the Upper East Side. We've got a band that, like a friend of mine named Frank Capsidis, who goes AKA Super Frank owned a school bus company at the school that my mom was a school nurse at in Riverdale Country School up in Riverdale, Bronx. Frank was also in the music business before the school bus company. He owned a radio station, so he was a DJ. After he sold the school bus company, he went on to start an entertainment business and ended up managing James Brown and Al Sharpton and all these other fucking people. Wow. Anyway, Frank introduced me to this guy named Chris Kemp, who is now one of the top jingle house writers in LA. And Chris knew this guy named Mick Grundahl, who was the bass player in Jeff's band, not at the time, pre Jeff. And we got together and played in this place. So like when I saw Mick again, I was like, holy shit, dude, I haven't seen you in years. What the fuck's going on? Right. And he's like, what's up, man? It's great to see you. And he's like, and then he's like, you sounded great, man. He's like, yo, I'm looking, we're looking for a drummer for the band. And I, uh, would you be interested? I said, sure. You know, and he's like, yeah, the guys, he's like, the guy's name's Jeff Buckley. Now I, my friend Chuck, Charles Scott, um, who lived in Tenafly, New Jersey, uh, uh, had just played me Jeff's record. He was a big shutter to think guy. And so like, um, so he just played me Jeff's record two weeks before. And I was like, yeah, this is cool. You know, I wasn't like, blown away or anything and then so when you say record you mean you're talking about grace Grace. yeah 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 you know and also i had a little bit of a like with chuck anyway so it's just like this guy's fucking (laughs) (laughs) so like you play on the record and it was like you know one time you know we were just driving around smoking cigarettes you know whatever and um and uh so when I went to meet Jeff, I wasn't like, I, he was nobody to me. Right. You know, like. He was just a guy that up, sang songs. Yeah, yeah, we ended up jamming on Paranoid, which was like the first song, I, the first album I ever fucking loved and bought with my own money. So that felt cool because I knew the song, you know, just being really cool. and just jam- We weren't doing any songs or anything, you know. He was just looking for a drummer to play with. He knew a lot of covers, yeah? Oh, yeah. Totally. That guy was a fucking guitar player. He voice. could fucking play his ass off. Good yeah. God. Yeah, he could. He, he was a, I mean, you know, when Hal Wilner brought him into the fray at the St. Anne's thing for Tim, there was a Tim Buckley tribute. Uh, I think it was 91 or 92 um, at St. Anne's in Brooklyn. Um Nobody sort of knew Tim had a son, you know? So like when Jeff came, it was like a big deal that he, when he started singing. And before that, Jeff really never sang. It wasn't like his thing. He was a guitar player in a fucking prog metal band. Right. Like what he did, you know? He was a fucking guitar virtuoso. I mean, there's an interview with Jimmy Page talking about Jeff. He's like, He's like, he was doing all the shit I was doing, but he was like, I couldn't believe he was doing all the shit I was doing without detuning the fucking guitar. Right. You know? Which is like, he learned all the shit thinking like that's how it was. You know? Right. 
So, um, ignorance is the mother of invention. Totally. totally. <laughs> you know, so, so I think that really helped just sort of like get along with Jeff and the, those guys is that I didn't really come in because then I went in a second time to context on Avenue A. Uh, there was a rehearsal studio there and he was having like tryouts still, you know, it's like the second round or whatever that I was a part of. And uh, I remember this guy came out of the room. I still didn't know what was going on. And, and uh, this guy came out, he, he had the puffy white pirate, pirate shirt on, you know, with the vest and <laughs> yeah. stuff and the bandana. And I said to those guys when I walked in, I was like, who's the fucking pirate just walked out of here, you know? And then all those guys were like starting to laugh. And it turned out to be the Saturday Night Live drama. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, but I think, I think just, I don't know. I don't know. From what I hear, Jeff liked the, the you know, that I was, I, he liked what he heard. I don't, I, I couldn't tell you, I wouldn't pick me. So he believed, he heard something that I had that he liked. And I know that, you know, from what I came to understand after he passed away and sort of while he was here, that he wanted to get away from the, sort of cover of grace that that portrayal of him right because he didn't like that you know that was columbia records that was trying to make him this like crooner like this singer you know this romantic you know he's a fucking rocker dude right you know he wanted to rock dude like you know so you know and he could and he also was super sensitive you know and, um yeah, it was interesting. Like, you know, I think just hearing about his legacy, it's like, you know, a lot of people had a beef with him back then because he was the, kind of like one of the guys during that time. And like, besides Chris Cornell, that would like kind of do a falsetto, you know? And like, you know, um, and even though, I don't even know if Chris did that because his voice is so powerful, you know? Right. So I, I don't even know if he did that. And those guys were buds, you know. So um, I know those guys talked a lot, you know. So it's just, um, yeah, and it was just, he was doing like Nina Simone covers and like, you know, Van Morrison covers and like all this shit and like covers upon covers and did the whole Sinead thing and uh, for a long time and like just solo and, you know, I unfortunately I did not get to see any of that. That was before I you know even knew who he was. He had stopped doing that. Right. Um, uh, you you tracked some drums on that second record, the one that's the Yeah. What, what yeah, did you play yeah. on? Um there well, there's a few songs on there, like uh Everybody Here Wants You is one of them. Uh there's uh, Nightmares by, Nightmare by the Sea, uh, Having Me Heard, um, uh, Witches Rave. Um, yeah, and there's a couple other songs on there. I think there's one other, two other on there. But there's there's the other guy that was on that record for there's a song, Skies of Landfill. And uh, I think there's Morning Theft is on there. But those two songs were done by a guy named Eric Adele, who just kind of vanished. Nobody knows where he is. He moved out to, you know, he, he wasn't the guy. He was like the guy sort of in between Matt Johnson and, and myself. And I think Jeff was just tracking some stuff. That was a really weird time. I was so young, man. Yeah. I didn't know Jack shit. Like, I, I was coming in from, like, fast you know, sort of like punk rock, like playing in like punk rock bands and shit, you know, um, like that excited energy, you know. So it like doesn't get a, less yeah. punk rock than everybody here wants you. Right. right. Uh, and it's such a pocket song. Yeah. I mean, it was, it, that was like, it was a, I mean, that was in me. I mean, I played a little James Brown records and all that soul shit you know and all those i used to buy go down to 8th street and buy like you know those rap mixtapes that fucking people would sell you know? right and like you know all these djs would like cut up shit and like you'd buy their tape 
you know, you try to find the right tape and then like you put it on the headphones and you play 45 minutes aside with all these like different things happening and find out later who did what, just sort of like Paul's boutique, you know, it's like, right. What the fuck is that, you know? Um, and then you hear later on, it's like, you know, oh, it's like Dyke, uh, you know, uh, Dyke in the trail uh, in the Blazers or something. And it was James Gadsden playing drums on that shit. So, you know, it's like, um, so, I mean, I was familiar with some of that stuff, but I never recorded anything like that, let alone recorded anything, really. And stylistically, yeah. had you played, I mean, you said you were coming from, from punk rock and playing along to like hip hop mixtapes yeah. and had you stylistically played like that before or were they were just like, here's well, how the we, song goes. No, well, we, we had, we had been rehearsing up until that, like, I mean, that was so weird about that whole scene. Man. I was like, I rehearsed with Jeff pretty much eight hours a day, five days a week. Wow. From like, from like October to February, you know, like it was insane. Just, just trying out all different and all shit, totally Always just instrumental. Then we had a we had one gig up at Orleans Grocery that you know was written about or whatever as this debut moment, and it was the and like literally four days before the gig, it was the first time I ever heard him sing. Really? Yeah. He because never you guys were so place. focused on the music. Yeah. Wow, interesting. That's yeah. insane. Yeah, he wanted to get the band like instrumentally just like right. And didn't want the distraction of singing and wanted to be able and to focus on And also just because he didn't want to kill his voice either. You know? Right. Wow. That's insane. So, yeah, it was insane. It was because I had no context for like the, you know. Right. The How the melody went, but it was, it, it meant nothing because the vocal was just going to go around the music anyway. I'm going to totally spoil it right now, but and I'm really nervous about releasing this episode, but um, I'm making an episode, a counterist episode of Everybody Here Wants You. And, oh, cool. and, you know, people fucking cherish that this music, and so I'm just fucking terrified of getting torn to pieces. I don't know if there's a song that I've done or an artist that I've covered that people hold on a higher pedestal hmm. you know I mean, you've done some amazing things man i mean all, all the things you've chosen are like heavy but you know it's yeah anyway i'm know. nervous See, about anyway, it I'll, I'll, i will say this so when i was digging that... into it what i realized is that song is almost pre predates how does it feel? Like the vibe of how does it feel? By whatever, six years or whatever, five years, right? That groove was just, Jeff and I went down to play pool somewhere in Memphis. We had, and, and Walk On By came on. Nice. And I, and I was like, we should try it like that. Were there different versions? Like... Well, he had been doing this. He had been doing. He, you know, there was a our friend Hod David who went, who ends up, who ended up being an MD for Maxwell for many years. Right. Um, him and Jeff were really tight, and um, and uh, Hod had a cafe called the Daydream Cafe up on Fifty First Street, and you know he would just have people come in and play, you know, and so Jeff would like kind of just go there and like. So the version that he had been doing was solo so and it was like and really the only thing there was you know that was sort of the heartbeat there was a heartbeat going right you know? um but that could be interpreted as a million bucks sure um but being in memphis isaac hayes hearing that vibe right. doing it as a band it just kind of was like well, that's kind of what that reminds me of. Just fucking do it like that, you know? So, I mean, the hard part about that was Tom Berlain was um, engineering that, yeah. producing that. And that was, uh, 
Tom didn't like me at all because Tom didn't think I was the guy. Um, and, you know, I was kind of butthurt about that earlier on. I wouldn't say I wasn't the right guy. I just understand where he was coming from as far as me being so green to something so mature. Right. You know, um, and probably him being able to hear the, the potential of what it could have been. Um, uh, and the first time I did some demoing with Jeff up in New York, it was not fair. We were up at this studio called Sorcerer Studio. And Jeff and the guys were in one room. And there was another room and another room. And then I was... I was three plexiglass <laughs> rooms away. <laughs> right. So I really had no shot. And, and Tom made his sort of judgment at that moment. And I was like, that felt really fucked up to me. Then we went in and we went and recorded some stuff all together in a room with a guy named Michael Klaus. And there's a song on that record called Here Haven't You Heard. And that's, I feel like that's sort of where could have gone more energetically. Like, I just feel like we're playing more together than that. The, the Everybody Here Once You Sung, uh, I've never hit a drum harder in my entire fucking life. Is that right? That snare drum was like, I mean, I was laying into that motherfucker. Because we were, we were at Easley Studios down in Memphis. And that's a pretty big room. But for some reason, the only way to get it the, that Tom wanted that fucking snare drum was like that, you know? Right. So that was, you know, yeah. So you, so this probably, this felt like pretty high pressure to you because you didn't have a ton of experience and you have this guy that's kind of barking up your tree. Yeah. And also that, um, you know, I knew, I knew a little bit of the backstory as to, as far as like what Jeff was up against he was in debt they were rushing us to get in there and do stuff the label guys like were coming down to like listen to what we were doing it's like get the fuck out of here but that was the 90s man right you know that was like you know get your fucking a and r motherfucker get and get your manager the fuck out of here we don't need you here they just wanted to be there to like fucking you know smell their fucking balls and be like we're doing right. such great stuff you know it's just like just get out and that was a real drag. Man. That, 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 that definitely interrupted the flow. Um, and then, like, you know, we, we had a listening party. Sort of like not party. I wouldn't say we were all fucking high on fucking coke. Uh, at, the, at the end of the uh, Memphis session. And we were just, like, listening all just with our shirts off <laughs> on, a, <laughs> on a couch in this really stale apartment, the band. And we were just all like, this sucks. <laughs> you know, we were like, this can't come out, you know? And uh, and so, you know, the next morning we were leaving and Jeff said, I'm going to burn the fucking tapes. Wow. And, um, and we were all like, thank God. And so like, when we got back up, that was, that was February of 20 something. When we got back up, he was gonna. He, he, he was like, he stayed in Memphis, finished up a couple songs, really beautiful songs on that record. Or you and I is on that, and I think he figured it out like Morning Theft, and then, and then he he stayed down there and he worked out the demos that are on that record, which is just fucking. I mean, that's what should have been happening anyway. And um, and you know, he just used the house. He used the fucking cassette four track we did those songs and um and he sent us those tapes you know and uh he's like let's do it and then the day we flew down he fucking drowned so you know that was just like that's what we were left with is that stuff you know so it's just it's so bitter sweet and it's, you know because it's like i'm glad something exists you know and, right and the and like you know it's not like it sucks at all but it's just you know um you guys so. unanimously agreed that you could have made that st stuff better i don't know if that stuff would have come out 
Like, I just don't know if that stuff would have come out. Maybe, maybe some of those songs would come out. I don't know. You know, but I uh, think you would have retract them or you just would have scrapped them because the vibe think, was like, off it, and it was time to move on. I don't know about everybody here wants you because that one kind of just happened. You know, um, that one kind of just happened. Uh, you and I kind of just happened. Um, there's a couple songs in there. That Do you know what song I love that's a sleeper is a yard of blonde girls. Oh yeah, that one, that one. So that one was fun. That one just kind of happened. Jeff was just like, let's just do this song. This is my friend Inger Laurie's song from the Nymphs. So that's Inger's song. And Inger was a friend of Jeff's. And uh, so yeah, we just laid that one down. And, like that one was like the only one I was like, I know how to fucking play this. Right. You know, I was like, I can do this one. This is cool. This is this feels like more up my alley. You know, that is a, that is a good one. That's fun. But again, that wasn't a song. Right. So, you know. I didn't know that. Yeah. 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 When. Fuck. So. After he passed, how long did you stay in Memphis? About a week. You we stayed there for a week. Yeah, we waited for his body to show up. Oh, Jesus Christ. Yeah, yeah, we, 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 you know, we thought first we thought it was Joe because we thought maybe he swank. I don't know if you've been down in Memphis, but you know where, where, um, have you been down? Yeah. You've been, uh, yeah. So do you know where Mud Island is? No. Like there's like in the city, there's downtown, there's this like sports place called Mud Island and there's a little bridge. And then like we thought maybe he swam across and he was just like, you know, fucking around, fucking around. So like, you know, I, we kept thinking he was going to like, but you know, Literally, we like flew down. We got the call. We went under. Next thing we were down, I literally went from the airport to the house to the river. And then it was like U boats and helicopters fucking trolling the whole thing. Um, and we just stayed down there because we didn't know what the fuck to do. We just waited to see what was going to happen. And then uh, the day we flew out, his body, his body uh, came up on Beale Street. Jesus Christ. Yeah, yeah, it was, it was crazy. Man. I mean, you know, um, it was crazy. Yeah. Um, when you went back to New York, mm-hmm. where, I mean, where was your head? It's just a weird thing because when I when I met Jack, um, something I mean, this I'm being honest about this, like something I knew wasn't gonna last about this. Um, I didn't know what would what what was gonna happen, but I just felt like this is not gonna last. You know, I don't know if that was my own insecurity or right. Just it felt it just felt too good to be like happening. So when that happened, it was a little bit of like a aha moment for me. Like, I mean, I, I hated to make it about myself, but I just felt like I knew something was not going to last. And um, I mean, that pretty much spun me out to like a really intense time of like drugs and alcohol for a while. Right. That really just kind of like, I had a girlfriend at the time and, you know, just, uh, you know, I, I joined a band called Grand Now in 1998, um, who was, it was a band that was, prior to that, Bill Whitten was in a band called St. Johnny and uh, Grand Now was signed to London Slash. Um, and, uh, those in the days where you get like a stipend to be in a band. Sure. <laughs> uh-huh. But it was a bunch of junkies and, you know, and uh, drug addicts, which is perfect. I was just kind of like allowed to just play. And it was fun rock and roll, but it was like, you know, it definitely was just sort of like dark, dark, darkness. You know? And then I met Elliot Smith and was playing with him for a little bit. Um, Wait a then- minute. Jesus fucking Christ. 
you Mick, yeah mick mick be, became friends with elliot after jeff passed and they made some demos at mix on a four track which i had from that uh and elliot was working on it's right after that either or record so uh the songs that we jammed on were for that xl record so it's between those records i love i love those records oh they're, they're just amazing right so like yeah so yeah so we would be rehearsing down at Ludlow studio you know and then we'd be hanging out the pink pony down there and like you know uh that lasted i don't know a couple months but it was like the times we got together mick was just so in such a bad spot because of all this jeff stuff that he really just he really went he was into the dope and that really like took him away so he would never show up to rehearsals so it was just me and elliot and we were going to have this like gig at the feds and i was like fucking psych man you know um but it never happened because right. mick never showed up and like those guys were just fucking out of it you know um so that was a bummer. But and Elliot, dude, holy shit. Talk about like, I mean, just being in the jam room with him, I was like, why am I here? You can play all the instruments better than me. He was incredible. You're, Unfortunately, you're, the only time I ever met him, he was in a in a bad spot. And uh it was yeah, it was ninety-eight or ninety-nine. He was visiting that's, Portland that's and I was playing with yeah. a mutual friends, so Yeah. That was the time. That was the same time, man. Um, so where, uh, where are you at with all this stuff when, I mean, you, after Memphis, you came back, you, you hit some ice in the road. <laughs> I hit some ice for a while. I mean, I, 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 um, yeah, I was playing Grand Mal band, you know, I got a job working and then I, I also, after that, me, my friend Joan, Michael from Black from uh, Jeff's band in 1998. We started a band called Black Beetle, and that was with a guy named Orrin Blowdown too, who was part of the Legion Fields this band, New York band, and he'd also played in the Lounge Lizards, and just a super musical genius guy. I mean, we, and that was like our morning. That was how we got through it together. You know, we formed a band, and you know, with Jeff, with Jeff Love, you know, and uh, you know, had that band, and that was like, I mean, I, I feel like without those guys, I don't know what, what I don't, I don't know where I'd be right now, you know, right. I'm still playing with Joan, you know, so, uh, yeah, I mean, we, we survived together, you know, through that stuff, and we did it with music, you know, I mean, there was drugs and alcohol, it wasn't just like, you know, music was like non-existent, but certainly everybody had their own you know secret things going on and then there was music at the you know thing you know going on. drugs and alcohol are such a powerful deceiver when you are in a time when you're trying to heal because you think well this is this is gonna get me away from those feelings but it just posts. i was 24 Right. No, you're fucking totally incapable of doing that <laughs> you know yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, it's just like, I was so young. I didn't it's know like, my you know, ass from a hole in the ground when I was 24 and, and Jesus Christ. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, I was 24 when he died. I was just so, Jesus, fuck, what the fuck, you know? So, you know, um, yeah, so the Black Beetle... That was awesome because it still was like the energy of Jeff was there, you know, and like that, like the the the, the sort of care of music was still there. Like right. there was so much caring about the craft of music. Michael Ty is a fucking genius guitar player, songwriter. So is Joan. She was just sort of like starting to sing back then, you know, and they would sing together. And um yeah, man, it was survival. I mean, we got through that fucking time. And like, you know, it was just weird because, you know, you're, you know, I'm a fucking, like you said, I, you know, I don't know. I don't even know who I am, let alone, you know, people like meeting people and being 
like being feeling connected to me because I was Jeff's drummer that may or may have not have been Jeff's drummer. It was such a weird, right. I still wrestle with that one, you know, like when I meet people, you know, I'm just like, dude, that was such a like flash in the pan. It happened, you know, and like, I don't doubt that we would still be fucking buds today. But like, right. You know? Yeah. Innumerable things have happened since then. Yeah, <laughs> totally. You know, and um, so like, yeah, I mean, you know, that all happened. I mean, I really feel like the music is sort of helped me live. That's what kept me alive. You know, I mean, all through my story of like drugs and alcohol and getting clean, and the music was always there. You know, how long there. before you reached that your threshold? Um. 2004. You said, uh, I've had enough. 2004. Yeah. 2004 um, was, you know, and it was a girl that kind of like made me stop. It wasn't my girlfriend. You know, my girlfriend finally like got rid of me. Right. And I was living in a basement, you know, with an artist. And like, you know, and then, you know, I saw the girl walk by and I was like, I want to marry that person, you know, and then I ended up dating her for 10 years, you know, um, but, and she was almost 10 years older than me, you know, so I was 31 at that time. And, uh, that was just sort of like, you know, walking out and taking one step down off a stair ledge, literally a concrete step and falling in my face and breaking my teeth. You know, because I've been drank five bottles of warm white wine in the middle of, you know, you know, at the end of June after watching Fahrenheit 9-11. You know, right. I was just like, you know, I was just like, uh, you know, this isn't this isn't going to work, you know, and all through, you know, all through it, all through that shit. Like, I mean, you know, the, there was a darkness through all that shit, you know. With Jeff dying and then meeting Elliot and you know and then it's like the band I ended up playing with there's always and then even some of those guys in Grand Mal were friends with the dwarves dudes so I was like hanging with the dwarves dudes you know so those, guy, Black, those guys you know? do it uh Blag does it pretty well not anymore no like he I saw the light Blag though back then man. he saw you know, the light so, too yeah I mean you know it put back then it was so dark man you know and um I'm glad to hear that. I'm glad to hear I didn't know that. That's great. Um, but like, you know, yeah, it's just like, um, yeah, it was just a lot. So like by the end of that, I was just like, I remember saying like, um, if this is all there is, God take me down. If this, I can't do this. Right. You know what I mean? Because like, I remember that the, the pinnacle of it was like, I just didn't care about music. And I was just like, that's not okay. Right. That's that's fucking terrifying. Do you remember the first show that you played after you got sober? And yeah, I was on the road with Adam Green from the Moldy Peaches. And what did um, that feel like? Were you? I mean, that that tour was great because um, Stephen, the bass player, was my friend that I played Mushmouth with. So. Like, I was with my oldest friend since I've known since I was three. Wow. Like, on the road. And then the guitar player was the other guy in Mushmouth. Because Steve got all of us in the fucking band. That's amazing. Because, yeah, so like, and then the guitar player's cousin was on keys. And so it was like, this whole family went out. Those guys weren't sober. But like, I was around guys I loved and... What really kept me sober was I went out on a tour and I was not sober with them. That was in 2003, 2004 it ended. But like for me, the first time going out with those guys, it was like I could be angry and I could tell. And it was like for me, what kept me sober was like seeing my friends be just a bunch of dummies in right. the dressing room. And I was like, you guys, and I would just be like, you guys are fucking weak pussies or whatever, you know, whatever it took just to like, feel like at the end of the night, I was still a soldier, you know, 
Right. I was like soldiering on. And then the next day seeing the carnage of these motherfuckers. And then and then like just being like, I'm not I'm not that. That's not me today. Uh, you, know? you know what I do not miss? I do not miss a fucking hangover buddy. No way. Cause I am a morning puker. <laughs> you know? Never at night. Morning. Yeah, right. Like, you know. That's I it. used to it's, make myself throw up. That's how I went to bed. So terrible. Yeah, that's how I threw up. I mean, that's how I did it. I was just like, I, I, the poison. You know, right. not thinking <laughs> not thinking it's already in my blood. You know? Yeah, 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 of course. Oh, oh God. Oh, dude. Yeah. Did, so, so anyway, yeah. How quickly, I mean, did you see a correlation between, like, like quickly when you got sober? between how you were feeling uh, to how you were playing to to gigs also? Well, I'll tell you this. Like I didn't never to toured work? before I was sober. You what? I never toured before I was sober. You never did. You've only toured sober. Wow. You're lucky you've never woke up in a strange town in a strange room, in a strange bed, and not knowing where you are. I mean, I did that plenty in New York. Right. <laughs> but you could walk outside and know where you were. In a strange yeah. town, you're like... Yeah, I've woken up on 14th Street. Right. You know. <laughs> <laughs> you know. You know. Like, where the fuck am I? You know? Right. Oh, 14th Street. Yeah. Um, no, no. Because, dude, uh, I mean... You know, I didn't get my license till I was sober. That's probably good. Yeah, I mean, I knew I knew not to get my license. Right. I didn't want to get fucked up and have a bad option. You know? Sure. Like, I mean, I kind of, I was like thinking about it. You know, like I didn't want to die. I didn't want to be a statistic. You know, all my heroes, Hendrix, all those motherfuckers, Bonham. I didn't want to be like those guys. Moon, all those guys, they, they're so badass. And like the best shit they ever did was when they were young. Well, because they were only ever young. Right. You know? Right. Exactly. And they weren't my age. They didn't get an op- they didn't get the opportunity to cover I Shot the Sheriff. And they also were in a different time. Right. And they exactly. <laughs> and they weren't. Or, or uh, after midnight. Um, <laughs> um, you know, I, I just, uh, you know, that shit runs really deep in my family too. And I, you know, it's like in my dad, you know, uh, seeing seeing the way that um, as a jazz musician, sort of like, you know, uh, used alcohol to like work him himself out of the scene you know it was very clear he was just a angry asshole right and very resentful about like all the things that weren't happening for him you know and as a direct correlation of his inability to make things happen for himself so it's just like right you know it's very clear not to say that it's not sometimes difficult to not, you know, just not want to just fucking be like, ah, but like play the tape and it's, I got it written out for me, you know? Right. You know, so it's just like, um, yeah, man. So yeah. And then, and then, and then, so I did the Adam Green thing and then simultaneously, like literally within I don't know, a few months, this phone rang and at this fucking uh, artist residency, I was or artist, you know, uh, they lived on Metropolitan, they had, I was living in the basement and I guess Joan had given Anthony my phone number and Anthony calls me from Anthony and Johnson's and he says, hey, you know, I, he knew he'd come to see Black Beetle play, he heard me sing, he liked the way I played. He said, you know, come in and do, a, 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 come and rehearse and with Rainey, 
Ortega, who was playing bass with Joan at the time, and uh, do a tune. So we met, you know, we rehearsed one day, and he's like, we're going to go in. And who's there? Who shows up with fucking Lou Reed? You know, Lou Reed's playing guitar on the track, you know? And, you know, we're, and Steven Bernstein, a horn player, put together, you know, a horn section. Doug Weaselman and some other people from New York, horn guitar players and shit. And like we do this song in like two takes, and Lou's got his back to everybody. You know, I'm like wearing some like old school like sweater, and I like, got my fucking bass drum painted, and I've got this like you know like uh, clamshell kind of like kit looking thing, and I'm playing this pretty like old school kind of Motown groove on the song. And Lou turns around and goes, I haven't heard a groove like that since the 60s. And I was like, I mean, come on. You there know, you go. Like, I mean, yeah, there you go. There it is. You know, and then Lori Anderson walks in. I've been blessed, dude. Like, you know, it's just <laughs> like, I mean, it's just kind of like, you know, and I attribute that to being in flow now. Right. And like believing in, in persevering, you know, and like what it is that I love, you know, I just. Did you continue to play with Anthony? Yeah, for ten, five years. Okay, so I, okay, so, yeah, and you toured? Yeah. I believe that I may have seen you play okay. at the Moore Theater in Seattle. Probably did. 2009 were you on yes. tour yep oh i was there incredible was there. it was uh yeah. it was an absolutely jaw-droppingly beautiful show everything oh, cool. about the show was incredibly like thoughtful and and sophisticated yet like not you know not overly delicate it was fucking life-changing like oh it the everything the stage was presented beautifully everyone played incredibly and uh i've been waiting for this moment in our conversation to to check and see if if you were indeed uh, playing that show absolutely i remember that show i mean i remember that time so well uh, yeah. Incredible. That's great. I'm glad. So glad, man. That's yeah. So, that's so cool. That's amazing. That's so cool. That's so cool. Yeah, those shows were incredible. I mean, at that time too, because that was like the end of the touring. Right? You know, that was like the last tour we did. He did as Anthony. You know? Right. And then, well, I think Anthony actually did more shows, but he got rid of the band we had and he started doing the orchestra shows. And then he, you know, he'd go to like, he just took one of the guys, Rob Moose, who's playing guitar and violin, and the piano player, Thomas Bartlett, with him, and they were like the MD, and and um, and they just, yeah, and the piano player, and then they did, they would go to different cities, London, Rome, wherever, and like hire the fucking orchestra. That's incredible. It's insane. Smoke you know, them if then, you like, got them is what I say. Smoke them if you got them. <laughs> <laughs> totally, man. I'm like, you know, I wish, I mean, I think I did see one of those shows. Um, so let me ask you yeah, this yeah, because yeah. the the presentation of that music in the in the live setting is very much like the recordings. Like the recordings feel like, you know, when you listen to those recordings, it sounds like, all right, well, this is a fucking this is a band performing the song beautifully. Um, and, but it's, it's very much different from all the other things that you've described that you had done before. Right. I learned a lot. I learned a lot in that, in that band. I learned a lot. Like, um, you know, first of all, a drummer playing with acoustic string instruments is a whole other thing. Right. You know, um, me being the only, really the only instrument that, besides piano, that's like articulating anything. And so the drums have, are so powerful as an instrument right. that they're, 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 they're statements, you know? It's a lot so of responsibility. It is. Dude. It 
to like, it was like so terrible. Like, you know, Anthony would always have, I'd, oh, I mean, I think with that and most, most, I think with Jeff and like, um, with, especially with Anthony though, and this is something that I uh, have learned is that as a drummer going into a new situation, uh, I try to play as little and quiet as possible, especially with a singer. And then I have them tell me that they want more. Right. Rather than just think I know what the fuck I'm doing. Go in guns blazing. Not maybe guns <laughs> blazing, but is this even just maybe just give it to my thing. Right. You know, because I'm not, if I just go in and do my thing, I'm not able to hear what's really going on. Sure. I'm just going and doing my thing, you know. And Anthony had, had like eight ears. So like, you know, you think you wouldn't hear everything that was going on with every fucking person that was playing, but he did. Yeah. And he would like really stop and like with the most abstract uh, fodder and, and way of explaining what he wanted in a very sensitive way, but also very meaningful way with visual, with a visceral visual you were able, he was able to sort of like give the idea of how he wanted the instrument approached at a certain moment in the song, you know, like this is like ice breaking. Here. Because he had a greater vision of what the, he wanted the listener to experience. You know, because also the lyrics he had, yeah, he, everything was a story. For him. It was right. a, it was a story. So he knew the story, you know, and he wanted the emotion behind the story and really like with that it felt like sort of what we were talking about earlier in, in, in the same idea but like not as not as forward is like you know everybody's supporting it's all support right nobody's nobody's sticking their head out so when in certain songs he'd say like this is all of you it was like i always felt like am i do am i too much or am i too little like i could never Age it because all of it was so suppressed all the time. Right. So it was like, you know, am I allowed to do this? Like, and if I didn't give it enough, he would like give me these lies and like, you know, I never knew, which was <laughs> like, you know, like and body movements and like, you know, I didn't know what that meant as because it's like real time, right. you know. And like, so he would just get really physical in his body to like try to get the groove happening because Anthony's groove is serious, you know. Yeah. Like it's it's really deep. Like, you know, I mean, the way he hears meter is a classical meter. So it's not, you know, if you're going like this, he's hearing a right. You know, it's like it's like kind of going like everything's sort of like on the top here, you know? So like there's a lot of everything's very light, you know, and there's a lot of like, you know, everything's dancing on the water and like, you know, and then there's like what's underneath? Usually the bass. It's like just holding those fat fucking notes, very, you know, and there's like syncopation between the piano and the bass. But everything else is like strings, you know, and vocal and like, yeah. It's really beautiful music. And Ant so Anthony didn't have a musical director. Anthony orchestra, like sort of like oversaw everything the instrumentation and the arrangements i mean everything. that couldn't couldn't be yeah i say in this most lovingly loving way like he is a, an absolute an ocd like right. in the best possible way you know right because the results are just mind-blowing the, the undeniable yeah yeah, yeah, yeah undeniable know? and it's so it's so like you said you use the word thoughtful it is that you know and it's so sensitive and it's like, I mean, I don't like the sound of hitting drums. It, I like, I wince like sometimes, you know, I mean, I have to, I like towels on my drums and I like, right. you know, I like shit like that. Like I like recording a lot because I don't have to give it like all the time, you know, like I can really hear things in the, in the headphones and I know I, I hear it more like a Beach Boys record in that regard, you know, uh, you know? sure. Um, but then I also love fucking grooving, but I'm so afraid to groove a lot of the time because it can go so south so fast. <laughs> if you're not, if you're not, if that word is just so set up to fucking fail. 
Right. But it's just like, you know, it's just like, but you need other people for the group. It's like, I don't, you know, it's like what makes a cool group is like everybody. Interaction. Yeah. Right. It's like a tapestry so with only, like, it's like a weave with only vertical strands. Totally, man. You know, that, it's like, the because the thing is, it's like, I want the drums to sound like a bass. Right. You know? So I can't be a bass. So fucking the bass player needs to play the drums. I never got into slapping. <laughs> I'm glad you didn't do that. And... But it seems like there are a lot of fucking bass slappers. Really? Still? Still. Maybe more than ever, there's a, there are a lot of really? bass. Yeah, fuck, there's a shitload yeah. of bass slappers, man. You gotta start sending me some videos. Man. It's it's crazy and it's but and and i understand that there's some there's some use for it in music but it, is there i mean i mean I, maybe if it, i can hear it in industrial music maybe no i mean in like dance music and funk music and some disc okay. but i mean none of my favorite dance bass lines are slap there's no. some that i that i like but they're not like hyperactive athletic masturbatory slapping yeah no i mean the only guy that's coming to my mind right now is you put a fucking phaser and a wah and throw bootsy in there or fuck and larry then, graham like he could yeah, slap larry, shit, you know larry, <laughs> like right, larry exactly. yeah. larry can do whatever yeah, the fuck I mean, he wants larry can do whatever he wants yeah that's true that's true that 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 fucking uh thank you africa you know you know that fucking he, I mean, I mean he, he invented it. Shit. He fucking. I mean, it's craziness. Yeah, yeah, it's craziness. Um, yeah, I don't. I, I mean, is that happening in in white people music? Uh, yeah, I see a lot of, I see a lot of white people <laughs> slapping the bass. Really? Yeah, but not I mean, uh, not I exclusively. Feel... It's not like it, it's not a it's not a uh uh you know white what white funky funky guy thing exclusively like no, there's some people that do it really but well know, but I, you know but i think there's there might be something to do with the church there sure you know like i don't know or just dance music i don't know i, yeah. I feel like I, I really wouldn't know how to use slap i mean i remember i the first time i really heard a white guy slap was skin sweaty man right but I mean, no. that's like that is a different thing. I like I don't even know what the fuck he's doing. Yeah, yeah. He's a vicious uh, yeah, he's freak. A, he's a punk. He's a punk. Yeah, the fucking punk rocker man. Here's something. Here I'll tell. I'll, I'll I'll drop this nugget on you because you know my wife. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Christine and I went and saw the Red Hot Chili Peppers at the Garden, not that long Recently. ago, four five okay. four or five years ago or something. You know. Yeah. We have yeah. a friend who was uh, part of the touring production and he was like, I'm in town. You want to hang out? Sure. What are you doing in town? Oh, I'm here with the Chili Peppers. Do you want to see the show? We laughingly said, yeah, sure, we'll stick around for a couple songs. And for the first 30 minutes, we were like, holy shit, this is fucking great. Oh, that's good. But, you know, it's also like, after a while, you know, like they hit, they hit a point in like whatever, some somewhere where all the songs got kind of samey, stylistically. Was and who was on, who was on guitar? Frushanti. Oh, and yeah. I really enjoy his guitar playing. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, talk about someone who hit an icy patch. That guy, I didn't think he was gonna make it back. I went and saw Trulio Disgracious. Do Never you remember? Heard of that. Trulio Disgracious was like guys from Fishbone and Weapon oh, of Choice cool. and like right. Snot and John Frusciante and oh. Arik Marshall also. Oh, cool. All these, it was like this, you know, funk super group and they toured around oh. and everyone played a set and, and Frusciante, oh, cool. I had listened to that, you know, that first, that first solo Four track so thing. Oh, it's incredible. Yeah. So great. Uh, but clearly the work of someone who's going through a time. Oh yeah. 
Um, yeah, that was a great record, man. I saw him I, I met, and I, so, I, yeah. I, I left the show. I mean, he didn't, he didn't finish up his first song. He dropped his guitar and walked off stage and he just looked like hell. And I left, I left and I fucking went home and cr- just cried. I was like, he's going to die. He's going to fucking die. Yeah, that die. was, yeah, I, I, I'm glad he's, I hope he, I hope he, he definitely made it through with some damage. Yeah. He had some damage going on there. Um, that, that, that is because uh, I saw them in 89 at the Ritz and I was like, like you know, right when Mother's Milk came out and that was just, that kid was on fire. A peak of their powers, arguably. He was on fire, man. Yeah. You know, and then to see him now, I mean, you know, not to say his guitar playing is any less, but just, you can tell like. He's also 30 years the, older like us. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. But you, I know you can still rip it, you know? I can still rip it. It's just, you know, it just, the music's got to be fucking good. Parker, when was the last time you fucking laid into it? When was the last time you fucking ripped it? Hmm. Have you been able to play much drums over the last year, year and a half? No, I played a wedding. I played a wedding last weekend. That was so fucking fun. Yeah, that's killer. That was so fun. I, I mean, I played three hours of covers. It was so fucking Dude, what I'll kind of, what kind of covers were of, you doing? Well, we did, you know, we did all the all the fucking hits. We did um, did some Gladys Night. We did some uh, we did some band. We did some uh, Fleetwood Mac. You nice. know, we did um, what else did we do? God, we did so much shit, man. Uh, I, I could pull up the list, but I'll tell you the the best song that I've never heard and nobody ever even gave a fuck in look at it was Robbie Williams has a song called Angel. Uh-huh. And that was like, fuck, this is a good song. This is a fucking good song, man. It like has a little bit of an oasis thing. Uh-huh. But it's deep. It's fucking deep. And it's just like it is a well written song. That guy is talented. Like I was like really just like I just get mad at myself, like, because I feel like I can be so judgmental right. about, you know, music and I miss stuff, you know? So, you know, I just don't even give it a shot, you know? Right. And maybe it's just like, but maybe it's also it's so overwhelming. Like, I need some people to like, just to be like, listen to this song, you know, because I don't want to have to weed through it. No, but imagine time, all of the great songs in the world, like, your neighbor that you have never talked to might have might have written one of the greatest songs you've never heard. Like we just don't even fucking know. That's one thing that still excites me about music is the unknown part. Yeah. I mean, it's just incredible how much music can be made. I mean, even like that thing, just like listening to Robert Plant and being like, fuck, like, I have no idea, like, you know, music just doesn't seem to stop. Like, I mean, to think that I know all the nuances, and you know, it's just like, you know, being and feeling a certain way on a certain day allows something in that might have never been able to get in before. You know, I did a, I did a, a, a recording session with a guy named Steve Marion, who has a band called Delicate Steve. Uh-huh. Um, he's a great fucking guitar player. Um, signed to anti records and he just does instrumental music and uh we went into this really cool studio upstate a few weeks ago called outlier in um and uh, it's in woodridge new york it's really it's dope and um we, i laid in there that was fun that was fun and we just recorded seven hours of music just like improvising shit you know oh sick so, yeah so that was fun that was really Hey, let me ask you this. You played with Cass McCombs, yeah? Yeah. Did you tour? I've never toured with Cass. Okay. I, I'm I, yeah, I've never toured. I've just I've done like I've done some recording stuff with him. And, you know, like we're always like he was just here. I just did some recording for this new record he's working on. And, um 
he's somebody I'd like to tour with uh, sometime down the road. But, you know, this talks for touring. Sure. I don't care how good you are. Like, you know, we all got, you know, just like, you know, I mean, I'm kind of over that. Like, you know, like I'd rather make records. Right. Any day of the week, you know, because that shit's going to be here long after I'm dead. Right. You know, and and if you can make a good record, there's no fucking better thing in the world. I mean, playing live is, there's nothing like that either. But I don't think I want to be on the road with, and I'm not saying it's back cast, but I don't want to be on the road with not sober people. Right. I just don't, I don't, I need to know, like, you know, you're out there, you're fucking together, man. You know, like, you, you know, I, I like being in the group, you know. I like knowing that we're all fucking, like, soldiering for and taking care of business and, you know, not being assholes to one another and, you know, without even knowing it, you know. And you'll be reliable night reliable, after night. Right. Yeah, and you're, you're, and you're talking about the show and, like, you know, you're fucking hanging out at the hummus bit and shit, you know. Yeah, there's nothing worse than like one person off has to cop or whatever. You know, you're just like in some fucking strange town and you're like, well, fuck, are they going to make the show? Well, also, it's like then it becomes their fucking tour. Right. Fuck that shit. You know, it's so, like you're not even the fucking lead act here, buddy. You know, like this isn't even <laughs> your gig. You got hired and we're all fucking waiting on your ass. Fuck that shit. Find a million other people. No. Did, where did you say Woodbridge? Woodridge. Woodridge. Where's Woodridge? Woodridge is over the Shawgunk Mountains and um, like upstate, and it's like where all the Hasidim go for the summer. It's so intense. It's, it's over. Like, is it over yeah. by where Woodstock actually happened? It's no. It's oh, I don't know. I don't know. It's near Monticello. Yeah. Yeah, okay. I think yeah. Woodstock actually happened over there. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So, yeah. So, I guess it is. Yeah. 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 I knew from your description of the place. Yeah. yeah. We looked all it's over so, when we were looking for our, for our place. It's so deep. Yeah. It's so deep. It's just like, you know, it's so crazy because it's like, you know, you've been in Williamsburg, so it's just like, you know, you can just be going down Bedford Avenue and like, all of a sudden, like, you know, one of them just throws their baby out in front of your car and you're like, ah, you know, and like, and you're like, just like, you know, upstate, there's like nobody on the, and you'll see them on the side of the road with their babies in this fucking world, like, and then all of a sudden, they'll like, start, like, they'll just kind of like put their baby in the middle of the road. And you're like, it's just like, guys, like, there's a whole road here. And you see, like, these, just this couple in the middle of nowhere. I'm, I'm like shocked because all I think about up here is deliverance. You know, just, uh, <laughs> you know, right. And like, I'm just imagining like, how are these, there's so much anti-Semitism up here, like so much, but you know, it's like, how are these guys not being like, just thrown into the woods? You know, I just don't get it. It's so scary. I feel scared for them. No, it's fucking terrifying. The world is fucking terrifying. I, uh, it's great. What is crazy about New York? more so than any other place I've ever been is that of course you get 10 minutes out of any city and it's the vibe is completely different. Right. But here so many city people are, are also getting out like they have second homes or their commuters or whatever. So it's not, you know, exclusively hick rednecks outside of the city. Right. Um, you know, there, there are a lot of city folks or as they yeah. call them in my little town, city <laughs> Where that's, are you? That's pretty good, where, right? Where are you guys? I'm in, we're in Stuyvesant. Oh, I don't, I don't Do you know, know where Long Pond is? It's the studio that the national guys have. Up oh, here. cool. No, I don't, I didn't even know the guys were upstate. That's just a couple miles from us. Um, oh, cool. it's like, uh, you know, we go into Hudson to, to go. West. We're on the on the east side of the river. Gotcha. gotcha. Yeah. 
So it's a little bit farther north than Hudson. Yeah, like 10, 12 minutes north. Yeah, the, yeah, the wedding was in Cairo. Oh, that's uh, on the other the side, Cairo. though, right? Gotcha. Yeah, must yeah. be. Yeah, that was so fun. I mean, it was so insane, man. Like, you know, I never played with those guys. We learned 30 songs, no rehearsal, just going there and winging it. Right. And like, dude, everybody was so stoked to just be there playing music again. It was just so dope, man. Everybody was just so jazzed. Like, the email thread after the wedding was just like, we got to start a wedding. When are we doing this again? You know, it's just like, man, you know, just playing with people we don't, you know, when people are like confident, it's just such a pleasure, man. you know? Yeah. Such a pleasure, man, you know? And like letting the keeping the egos out. Like I felt like Mr. Rockstar up there. And I was like, you better check yourself. Because nobody else is fucking gives a shit. <laughs> I was walking around that wedding like, when's the gig? When's the gig? You know? <laughs> I, you know, I was just like, because it's a wedding. I don't right. not, I'm not I'm not drinking, yeah. I'm not doing anything. Everybody's getting hammered and shit. And you know, I'm just like you know, wearing a pink shirt just to make myself feel more uncomfortable. And, you know, I'm walking around and I'm like, hot, you know, and I'm like, just sort of like, just waiting to fucking throw down. And that feeling of waiting to throw down and getting to throw down, it's just fucking best, man. There's nothing just better. The- Let me ask you this. You said you had 30 songs, so you, you played like, you played three sets? No. To, one set. The whole time. Yeah, Amazing. Man. Okay. Yeah. So how did you prepare for that? Did you break out listened. your kit? You just listened no. a lot. Yeah. I listened yeah. for two days. You know, because I mean, half the songs I know. Right. But like, you know, but the, you know, but there's certain like things like, oh, right. I really got to figure out that Bill Lambs on the four to get back, you know, to the one, like, you know, whatever. Um, Shit like that, that I just think I know, but it's a little trickier than. Right. Bringing it to life is a different thing. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. And uh, yeah. And also just like arrangements, like knowing, you know, I mean, I wrote a whole notebook of notes, you know, just for myself, not like any musical notation, like scroll, like, and then this happens because I don't write or read music. What was the, before the wedding, when was the last time you played live? Year and a half? Year? Oh, shit. Well, um, oh my God. Dude. I mean, I've been making records. Right. So okay. Like, all I've been doing, you know. Right. Um, and like we're recording live in the studio. Sure. But like, it's been a while. That was a real treat. That was a real treat. Man. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, again, it's like, you know, yeah, man, what is two? So 2019 was the last tour I did. And then 2020 was making records. And then the pandemic. But uh, it was like zero to anything, you know? And then, yeah, and then this year, records, live recording, no people. I think that, I think making records is is some of the most exciting parts of, like it's the, the some of the most exciting parts of music. When you go out live, it's like, you know, it's fun to execute and do this, do the thing. But when you're creating it, there's a different spark, you know, it's like, this is how it's going to live forever. Yeah. I mean, I, in the, and and what's interesting about, you know, I mean, the past few times I've recorded, the thing that's helped me the most going into the recording is going up to the person whose songs they are. For me, 
and saying, my ego is not my amigo. Just saying it out loud yeah. to the person and getting a laugh, but also <laughs> just to like let the person know that. I'm like not here to like, this is not about me. I'm here to fucking, you know, throw down. You can trust me. You know, like this is happening, you know, like, and also it's to say to me, like, fucking keep your shit out right now. Cause you don't know what's about to happen. There's a lot of it. The songs you walk in, I don't know what the songs are. So it's like, you know, you're learning shit real time. You're making a real record. So there's that kind of recording. And then there's the other kind of recording where you're like, Okay, we keep doing it again and again. You know? Right. You know, and I've made those records which have taken two years to make, which I'm happy with. But at do you the have, same time, yeah. Do you have producers that that you are, are a regular call for, or do you, is it a circle of artists that sort of are familiar with your work and they they come yeah, and seek you out? More the artists, more the artists. Thing. Yeah. I mean, I have, you know, I, I think this year has been more about like have to use some of the cards coming up in the future. Like I have so many cards I don't use, you know, like it's not, not, not in the sense of like, but like just in the fact of this, I sell myself short because of the people I played with and because I feel like I get in the sense of like a lot of the time that I'm afraid that if I ask for help, I lose some sort of leverage as not only like monetarily, but like even my ego takes a little bit of a, a little bit of a knock, you know, because it's like, and like, because then I'm putting myself out there. And then I really have to be accountable to like what I'm asking for, you know, right. like, you know, it's not like somebody's just coming to me and be like, dude, you're the guy and I can do whatever the fuck I want. Right. Or like, I, you know what you're going to get, you know, where it's like, if I go out there and I go like, Hey man, and help me and help me and like, this is what's going on. What do you got? Anything? Oh, you got a number? Sure, give me that number. Oh, you got an email? Cool. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like maybe just you know take my number. Like what? Whatever. What it doesn't. Or it could be like I need to do this. Like I need help. I need to make some go, and I need to fucking hurt. Whatever. That's kind of how I roll. Right. Because I can, I can convince myself that nobody wants to play music. You know, sure. because it takes a lot of effort for me to like, um, I'm sensitive, man. Like we all are, but like, you know, I don't want to play music with just everybody. Right. There, you know, it's like, I know what I'm good at and I want to make, and when I hear something that I like, I want to be a part of that. But like, I also have to remember a lot of the time that the things that I'm hearing that I like, the reason I like them is because the people have already found the people that they like to make the music with. Right. Let me ask you, know? you this. Are there, who are some artists that are like, that you look at and you think I would love to play with, I would love to play with them. Who are three, three artists that you think if there was a vacuum in that band in the drum seat, I would love there's, to there's, a, there's a guy, maybe you've heard of him. Like, I really would love to try and play with Curtis Harding. I don't, I don't know, know who that, that is. He, he was, uh, he's one of CeeLo's guys. He's like a singer uh -huh. from, 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 um, from, uh, you know, Norris, Norris Barkley guys. Danger uh -huh. Mouse would be somebody I'd love to fucking work. You know, like, oh, wow. You know, like those kind of dudes, like, cause like those guys would, are just making cool fucking music. You know, and then they got they got the technical savvy to cut shit up and make beats and shit and like right. you know, and they're not afraid to like, you know, like up they're not afraid to layer drums and get into all sorts of other fucking cool shit, you know? Which is like really exciting for me. Because I don't I think like drums get undersold as like a palette, you know. I feel like they haven't been explored enough. 
like is in real time recording because everybody can make a beat on your fucking computer now. Right. Just doesn't doesn't even like nobody's even thinking that way, you know. But like to me, it's like getting the human feel is still lacking and all that shit. You know, it's a very specific sound and it's at a certain frequency and it's like coming through your computer speakers because it's put in logic or, you know, Ableton and whatever right. the fuck you're using, you know? And there's this shit that there's so many things that aren't being explored with palettes of, of drumming recorded, you know, of overdubbing drums. I mean, you know, that, I feel like there's like a whole like thing that I just want to be able, I want, I want to trust somebody. And I, I feel like a producer would be somebody I'd want to work with. So like there's, there's an artist who like writes good songs like Curtis Harding's great. I'd love to work with Danger Mouse. And then let's see, I mean, I mean, honestly, I, I did something terrible. Like I reached out to Mike Campbell, like about his Dirty Knobs band. Yeah. You know, I just kind of was like, you know, who's, you know, like I'm your guy. Not <laughs> thinking like, not thinking like, you know, these guys are so tight, you know. Right. Like these guys are probably making music for years outside of Petty you know? But like something like that, like in that realm, I'd love to be in a band. Did like, you actually reached out to him? Well, I mean, over Instagram or whatever. Did you get crickets? I know he's, yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. totally. I get a lot of crickets. I know about crickets. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, like a, like a, just a fucking, just a fucking good old rock band. I really want to find one of those now, you know? I saw the Dirty Knobs play, uh, I don't know, six or seven years ago at NAM at a, one of the party, after party things, yeah. you know? Yeah. And it was, it was fucking fun. Yeah. Earl Slick yeah. played that night, who lives uh, down Nyack, I think. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and there's and then like you know there's that, and then I just think of like I mean, I would never want to work with a guy because it's probably a disaster, but I would love to fucking find somebody like Tricky to play with. It's uh. one of the one of the one of the best shows I ever saw was at this place down near wetlands and it was like right um, it was 1990 it was 1996 and I saw Tricky at this like and they were doing stuff off that nearly God record and um, dude it was I mean it was some of the fucking coolest shit I've ever seen it was like the best of that whole fucking Bristol scene, like, you know, like trip hoppy with a real band and, you know, the electronic shit and synthesizers and the fucking samples and the fucking, fucking, I forget the chick's name who sings in that band. And Tricky just came out and he was so high and he can only perform five songs and <laughs> he fucking had to get off the stage. But man, they fucking laid it down so hard and it was so powerful. I want to be in a big band where, where like, I don't have to like think too much. Right. Cause there's so much, so everybody's taking care of fucking business. Man. Like that, that kind of shit is the shit, you know, like again, back to like everybody with the rhythm. Thing. Yeah. You know, I think being in massive attack would be fucking incredible, but you'd only, you'd only work once every 12 years. <laughs> and it's a very controlled environment. Right. That would that would sort of like, unless I was like in on the ground floor of that creating that music, I don't know if I'd want that commitment. Right. You know, because otherwise I'd just be playing the tracks. Right. You know? you know, and I think the drummer probably might have. Yeah. He, I mean, like, yeah, yeah. I'm just trying to think of one other one other person that I that I'm just sort of like in awe of. I mean. She had a stroke, but I would have loved to play with Tina Turner. Oh, dude. Did she have a stroke? Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah, she's, I don't, a few years ago. Oh, yeah. that's, that's terrible. I mean, I think she's okay. You yeah. know, like, I don't think she's like all fucked up, but like. She's not going out and, and doing it. Nah. 
you know, like just somebody like that. Right. You know, like just. Yeah. You know, um, because man, it's when you, I mean, even doing this wedding, dude, the, the few singer, we had three different singers and when these chicks laid in, they were all chicks. And when they fucking laid in, man, I mean, they were like, fuck, it was like saying like a wreath of some of these, you know? Yeah. And, you know, not, but like, you know, yeah. Um, and the voice is such a commanding, it's like the thing that ups the ante when you're playing music, you know? It's just, you know, it's all just support for that. I feel like it's so funny. I, I, don't know, I don't know how much more time we have, but I just remember like there was a time when I'm sure you can relate to this, like growing up, you had your band. I, we could never find a fucking singer. Right. <laughs> yeah. In the nightmare of that, you know, and, you know, and then once you find a singer, it's just like, holy shit. Holy shit. Like, I had no idea. Like, the command of the human voice when it is felt is like, I mean, that was a whole reason why I I kind of got my friend Sam and I from the movie Suzuki. He kind of like, this is what my take on it. When I met Jeff and I was doing the movie Suzuki, Uni Suzuki hadn't gone the whole mod scene yet or whatever they did. But I said to him after we hadn't found the singer and Sam was singing, you know, we'd always been making four tracks and shit and sharing tapes and stuff and writing songs and blah, blah, blah. But um, I said to him after, because we were in that, we were playing with guys that were like calling us, you know, chefs at the Elephant Castle you know, you know, fucking, you know, dreads and, you know, you know, singing song about playing with mirrors and shit like that. You know, it was just awful. You know, it was right. just like, you know. So when I met Jeff, I said to Sam, like, you know, dude, it is like, how's it going? I was like, man, it is like so cool to play with somebody that can sing. <laughs> yeah. And that was sort of like the end of our band. We took it personally. Right. And I was like, just, it was a, oh, that's still an unfortunate, uh, thing. we're friends and everything's cool, but like it really just kind of divided a friendship. And it's just, you know, it just makes me think like, I just have to be careful with it because we're all so fucking sensitive. Right? And you were also 24. Yeah. Yeah. 23 at the time. Right. 23. I mean, I cringe. I shudder to think uh, the things yeah. that I said when I was 23. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But just knowing, you know, like when, when, you know, knowing how much, you know, your friends care about music and stuff, you know, it's just, right. uh, yeah, you have to be, you know, I feel like that it's just important to be gentle with, you know, thinking about, it's always about honoring our friends and music, man. You know? It's always like not even not even like shying away from the from the the accolade that just is deserved from the perseverance of somebody doing what they do for the sheer love of it. You know, like that person deserves accolades, like because that only comes back, you know. Right. Um it's good. It's good karma, man. I wish that I had the grace to appreciate even things that I don't like, you know, the way that I do now. Like if I hear something that I don't, that doesn't strike me, I still will think to myself, you know, that's making someone happy. Even if the only person it makes happy is the person that made it. That's fucking good enough for me. I used to go to shows with this girl that I was dating for 10 years and she was 10 years older than me. And 
I would go to shows like, you know, and, uh, right. And, uh, you know, she'd be like, what do you think? And I'd always have some weird fucking shitty criticism right away. Right. And she'd be like, she'd be like park. I really liked it. They were having so much fun. I was just like, they're having fun. Right. They're having fun. This is, this is all about, man. This is all about having fun. I mean, I love doing it, but it's like, if you're not having fun doing it, something's not working. Right. right. You know what I mean? I mean, I can take myself as seriously as anybody. But if I like not having some sort of like fun in, I mean, the fun comes from the live thing. Right. But not with, not with Anthony. That was terrifying. Because <laughs> you, you were, because you were well, being no, listened to. It was, it's not a hearty, har, har slapstick show. <laughs> no, it's not. There's not a lot of yuck, yuck, yuck. Well, you just knew that you were going to get notes right after the show. <laughs> That's all. It was just, you were going to go in the back of the dressing room and then you were going to get notes and then everybody was going to say good, good night to each other. Yeah. Amazing. Which is cool because then it just makes you, you know, it's important, man. You know, it's important. We, you know, the thing with live, what you were saying before is like, you don't really know how you're doing. That's why, like, when I was on the road with Timo, he would record all the shows. When did you tour with Timo? 2008. He joined Jones Band. All right. I remember that. So, was he so playing we were, bass? Yeah. So like, but he would record all the shows and he would be like, you guys want to listen to this? And I was like, but like he did. No, he records everything. The thing is what I've, one thing I've learned in the last couple years from, I don't pay a, a ton of attention to it and it hasn't changed. It's changed my approach, but not my filter. Yeah. And that is I record myself and listen back so much and everything is like a single take. So there's no fixing anything. There's none of that shit. Most, right. most of my performances are yep. first or second take because that's how the, that's how this started. First takes. Gotcha. And, uh, listening back is a, it's a, it's a motherfucker. Yeah. Cause like, you know, sometimes, sometimes you listen back and you're like, I fucking crushed that. And you didn't. <laughs> you didn't. Well, you let me know when we can have that conversation because that is a fucking phenomenon. Best show we've ever had, guys. Crickets from the audience. Right. Worst show of my life. That was the best show I've ever seen. Never fucking... It's, it's because the ego is out of it. Man. Right. There's something going on there where you are aligned with the higher thing going on. Once it, once the sound leaves, once the, the sound wave leaves your speaker or your the your bottom drum head, and it enters the room, it is not yours anymore. That's right. It's not but yours. But even but 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 it starts here. Right. You know. So it's like if I can get out of that fucking way of that. And trust that what I'm doing is going to work. If I don't try to do anything, if I don't try to deviate from the path when I shouldn't, it's going to work. Because, like, my tendency is like to be like, maybe I should just, is this good? Am I do and then it's like, <laughs> no. <laughs> and um, it's like you're thinking about it. I have to go, you know, I have to drive into Hudson and pick Christine up at the train cool, station. Man. Um, yeah, man, cool. I've had a really, really great time talking with you. I'm ex really excited for this, uh, the episode that we're working on to come out. Uh, cool, man. Yeah. I'm, you know, I'm waiting on, I'm waiting on someone to deliver their tracks. Right it's on. kind of, I've learned a lot of patience doing this. Man, I think what you're doing is great. That's pretty fun. I hope That's that so uh, someday we can actually play together. Me too, man. Me too. I don't know. We we should just uh, 
try to connect a little more. Tell me what you're doing and like, tell me, let me in on what you're, what you're up to. And I have I'd be curious uh, just to hear, just to hear what you're up to. I have a lot of ridiculous uh, things in the works. Cool. One of the most awesome. ridiculous things, speaking of big bands, is I want to put together a fucking giant band. I basically want to, I want like war. Can you put, if you get two drummers, I'll be one of the drummers. Well, uh, Marcus Farrar says he's in. It's pretty yeah. good. I mean, you know, I'm all about supporting the guy who's really good. <laughs> <laughs> uh I'll i just want to have space. this i want to have this fucking giant percussion heavy he, heavy funk band gotta have two drummers then yeah dude you gotta have two drummers no i think yeah, so yeah, 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 i think that the two drummers actually set up back to back like like well they should see each other because then they can get in the pocket and know where everybody's playing together. You think they should be facing Absolutely. each other? Yeah, yeah, totally. You don't no think symbols. That... <laughs> <laughs> See, conceptualizing the stage plot is half of the fun for me. It's like still seventh grade where you're like making up a band name and making a, up a logo. Still, there's a guy just playing cymbals. Only. Still, yeah, right. Just like uh, <laughs> these highfalutin recordings people, the kids are doing these days. Yeah, it's got like a whole cymbal setup, like just just cymbals everywhere. And it's yeah. mic'd 360 in a, the house. We only play houses with uh, Omni surround. Yeah, and he, when he hits his symbol, a light goes on. You know, some different color light goes on. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man. Uh, hey, you know what? You're fucking great. Likewise, dude. Um, again, I ha- thanks for giving me so much time. I didn't. Dude, I didn't. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm know glad we got a chance to wrap, man. I didn't know what we were gonna what we we're gonna be getting into, but. Uh, oh, good. A pleasure. It's such a pleasure, man. I really appreciate the time. Thank you so much, buddy. Anyway, hey, yeah. if you have any photographs of yourself, I need to make some. Uh, you've probably seen some of my propaganda posts that I put up. Uh, cool. I'm like, going to manipulate what, what, how many, it. What, what, what do you want? You want drumming photos? Yeah, that? yeah. Maybe uh, like one one shot that I'll use for the actual episode, which is could be a drumming shot or could just be a candid photo. And then the cool. others typically are, are performance photos. Yeah. All right, cool. So, like, three photos? Yeah, one th- of those. yeah three okay, pics would be killer. Yeah, thanks, man. Oh, yeah, awesome. All right, I'll send those to you. And uh, tell Christina said hi. I will do and, it. And, uh, yeah, I'll reach out to you soon, man. Just, you know, I'd love to hear what you're working on at some point, too. I'll tell you about my ridiculous solo record. That sounds great. Look right. forward to that. Me, too. Oh, I'm working on some, too. So Killer. Yeah. All right, Have man. a great weekend, I'll talk man. to you later. All right. Likewise, brother. All right. Bye. Peace.